Hey, good afternoon, everybody. So we're about almost at the uh, first mini break. Uh, I have brought in the pup fester to help everybody encourage you as you're going into the break, try to feel a little more uh, excited. So if you want to just pet her or Aaron, come back, please. Good girl. <laughs> So what do I want you to do today? On, if you go to the lecture notes and schedule, I've included a new link here uh, that says in-class assignment directions. And if you select it, it'll bring you to this page. And so what I would like you to do is to follow these directions on that page. And once you've created your LEC07 folder, you're gonna be running this wget command and I'm going to quickly run it for you so you can see what should happen. So when you run the wget, it's going to download a bash script. And then you give the computer permission to run the bash script with set setup.sh. And then right now it should just say setup.sh and be in green. And then after you do that, you do dot slash setup.sh. And it's going to start downloading several other files and setting everything up for you. So it's going to look like that. And then if you do ls space star, you're going to now see several folders that have been created and several files that have been downloaded and that'll set up the in class assignment. So please take a moment to follow those directions, check out the appropriate branch and uh, get everything set up. While you're doing that, um, I'll just quickly mention that I am going to, uh, on Tuesdays, we're, we're going to start doing this on Thursday because I want you all to get some more coding experience in C++. But what we're going to do is on Tuesdays, we are going to do in-class coding. And on Thursdays, we're going to do the Sakai problems. So that way we can strengthen your coding skills yet simultaneously do the kinds of problems so that way you're also prepared uh, for the midterm exam. And then the labs will be working together on uh, common leap code interview problems that apply data structures that you're going to be learning. Uh, so the mini break is starts uh, Friday. Um, there's no lecture on Tuesday. And so I've also, there's also no lab on Monday and Tuesday, so that's mentioned on the syllabus. Um, so I won't be holding office hours on Monday or Tuesday. And I have a little note, tomorrow's my wife's birthday, so I'm gonna be very hard to track down tomorrow just to give you all a heads up. And one last thing before we really dive into this coding, I really want you to take this opportunity as you're working through it to see if there's something that you don't understand and start asking questions and having a conversation on the Slack. And we're gonna be typing things together. I would encourage you as we start out to not think of this as mindless copy and pasting. Everything that you're putting down, if you don't understand it, start asking questions in the Slack. Start communicating with each other. You know, it's not like, you know, look to your left, look to your right, only one of you is gonna make it. That's not what we do here, right? We're here, we're helping each other, we're strengthening each other. So ask the questions and identify and correct some misunderstandings so that way when you go into future coding challenges, you'll be in a really good position to succeed. So what we're gonna be doing, as those of you who are finishing up the directions, we're gonna be building up aggregated classes. We're gonna be reviewing how to do everything with make files. We're gonna be implementing a templated class. We're gonna review nodes. We're gonna learn how a doubly linked list works. We're gonna see the pros and cons of doing memory allocation of the right ways and how to make sure you can control it so it doesn't uh, explode on you. So that's really what we're gonna to emphasize today. So a lot of combining all the concepts. So Lindsay, that the link is on the course page. If you go here, you can click on in-class assignment directions. If you click on that, that'll take you straight to the uh, other link here. And it contains all the directions you, you should be able to see. All right, does anybody have any other questions about uh, getting everything set up? Is everybody got, got all the code downloaded? Please give me a thumbs up so that way I know how we're all doing. All right, good. 
And same thing, I'll try to monitor uh, how everything's going on in the uh, Zoom as well. So the first thing I would like you to do is we're gonna learn about this idea of guarding header files. So guarding header files is what we do to ensure that when we are making, including a library in multiple different places, that we don't make multiple copies. And when you make multiple copies, the compiler can't tell the difference between which one should be used and says your program can't work. So by guarding the header file, we are going to do this. So first I want you to go into the include folder and open address.h and you're gonna see it's step one. So if I refresh here, everything I just downloaded and it address.h, you're gonna see that I have this step one guard the header files. And we're gonna do the same thing at the bottom with end if. So this allows us to be able to include in very large libraries and programs like those you might encounter in industry, guarding header files becomes really important. So we do if not define and it's the convention adder underscore H. So I F N D E F stands for if not define and then pound define ADDR underscore H. And so once you have that done, go down to the bottom of the page and you'll see another thing. It says step one guard header files again. And from there you want to do pound and if. So it's like an if statement. And that allows you to be able to include them in multiple places and do effective compilation. Does anybody have any questions so far? So I got a, question, a lot of questions about guarding header files. I wanna make sure that that's uh, clear to everybody. So the next step, we're actually gonna start doing the libraries itself. Whenever you're writing a library in the .h file, you, you wanna include the C libraries or C++ libraries that you're gonna use in that particular library. So here we're gonna do pound include IO stream and pound include string. So whenever you're planning out your programs, you wanna think, what do I need to do in order to be able to do these tasks? So you wanna follow these kind of similar steps when building a program. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do those pound define directives. So this will allow us to be able to include for standard C out, pound defined, end L, standard end L, and pound define uh, string, standard string. And one thing you're gonna see when you're doing this, and we're gonna, this is gonna become kind of a big project that everywhere we include address adder.h will also include those directives and will also include those libraries. So we don't need to do it over and over again. So if you plan it out properly, you can effectively lay out your flow of your libraries and not have to do pound include IO stream in several different files. All right, does that make sense so far? All right, and I should point out uh, for these in-class assignments before uh, we get in, do you think if you, the full credit is for a good faith attempt. So if you have some sort of weird compiler error that you can't track down, it's okay. All you gotta do is push the code to get. The TAs will just check to make sure that you actually tried to follow the steps. And then we can address that in office hours. And it's also gonna be due Friday. So that way those of you who are trying to work on CCO2 and might not be able to be attended from home, will have the opportunity to do that without uh, any worrying about uh, conflicting with that assignment. All right, so I see there's a uh, something being typed, so I'll address that question in a moment. So here's step two. Now we're doing step three. And now we're gonna do step four. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna go over again this idea of overloaded constructors, and I wanna go over the idea of const and call by reference. So first, I'm not getting the test.h. You shouldn't be getting test.h. Uh, I deleted that. We're not gonna run a test script. You have to do the, uh, the standard names on each file or just the header. So Ella's question, you only need to do it in the header file. And what we're gonna see as we include everything is that that's the only place we're going to need to include it in the entire program. So we take advantage of including the libraries 
so, so that way we don't have multiple copies of it and we can do effective coding while only having it in one library. So that, uh, did that address both of your questions? Awesome. Okay, so what I wanna do is we're going to do a method declaration in .h. And we do method declarations only in .h when it's not a templated class. So what we're gonna do here, scroll down. So you wanna scroll down to step four. So here we have a default constructor and we're gonna write the overloaded constructor. And the overloaded constructor is where we're gonna take in all the information for the address and type it out. So here would be adder and const unsigned int call by reference num in. And then we're gonna do the same thing for name, city, and state. You see the private numbers, we have string, street name, street city, and street state. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do const string call by reference. I'm just gonna copy this so that way we can type it a little faster. Do name in comma. And if you're doing things like this, you can actually do enter and tab and it'll still work. And then we're gonna do city in. I'm gonna do state in. And then last, I'm gonna do const unsigned int zip in. Now for an overloaded constructor, when it's not templated, you just end it with a semicolon, All right? So when you have this, what's gonna happen is we can copy this and put it into the .cpp file. And so there is the, uh, so for Connor, you came in, uh, if you're a little bit late, you're welcome to go to the lecture page, click on, there's a link under lecture seven that shows the directions on where to start and the slides will have all the directions for the in-class assignment as well. So you're able to do that. The other question, so variables are constant in case the user wants to enter a number and string without a variable that is exactly right 100%. Right, does anybody have any other questions? So now what I would do is here, I can copy. And then we're gonna go into the .cpp file. So I'm gonna minimize that. And then I would go into adder.cpp. And we're gonna see here that we have the same thing. It's already been set up. And notice I have the colon colon here. So that means we have attributed it to that particular class. So for those of you who are working on CCO2, you now know that you can have multiple structs and multiple classes in the same header file, as long as you have the class colon colon to coordinate which member, which uh, method that belongs to. So if I were to do the same thing, so actually I could do this, that also works, right? When you get to this point here, you see we have num in, name in, city in, state in, zip in, and you can do this and press enter. And now you can put the member initialization list with each element on one line. So this helps you uh, be able to read it. So you could do this or you can do tab like that. And then the way that I have it in the slide, you see how I have the slide and on each line, I have another member of the member initialization list. That allows me to be able to make it easier for someone reading your code to be able to tell what's going on. So for example, I'll get to your question in a second. So for example, you go into TA's office hours, you're asking to help uh, troubleshoot your code and it's all squished together and the TA starts getting a headache because it's very uh, difficult to interpret. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna type this up and then I'm gonna get to the question in the front here. So basically we correlate the private member with the one that we're reading in. So we have to do them in order. So we have street num. So let me do this. I'll do enter tab. And then we do street num. And that correlates to num in. 
comma, enter, and we see that it's tabbed, and we see street, name, and that goes with name in, enter, and then we go with street, city, and you have city in, comma, then we have street state, and we have state in, and then we have zip code, which is the name of the private variable, and we link that with zip in. The last part is that you have to put those brackets there. The brackets, if you recall from when we went all the way back to that nothing.cpp where it was just int main bracket and inside it was return zero, that is a procedure that indicates that, all right, I'm gonna allocate all this memory onto the data heap, and create this new class object, which is why we conclude with those two brackets there. All right, does anybody have any questions about this so far? Yes. Does the what? Uh, well, in this case, no. It, it's. It's C++ is very different than Python. So Python, of course, all the tabbing is, is extremely important. In here, white space is not as, as, as important, no. But the crucial thing here is it's a little easier to read, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's what's going on there. All right, so the next step, what we wanna do is we wanna visit this friend operator and kind of go over this again. But first, if you were to save it, so if I save it and I save adder.h and I upload these. So if I'm in the folder with the make file, if we've done this correctly, we're gonna get a massive compiler error. I wanna show you what it is and how to handle it if you get one of these in C++. So if I do make adder test, uh-oh. Get one of those, your new program, you say, oh my gosh, it's lines upon lines upon lines upon lines of code. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be in Dr. Morrison's class forever. What am I gonna do? When you get in a situation like this, what you should do, take a deep breath, scroll all the way top to the first error. If we scroll all the way up here, we're gonna see that and you just read this, it says no match for operator. What happened in address test, I am printing an adder object. I'm doing this. See these two lines? So I have not defined a friend operator. So what's going on is that C++ is trying, all right, I can't figure out what it is. I'm gonna overload it with this, and I'm gonna overload it with this, and I'm gonna overload it with this. And so that huge list of error messages are actually notes, right? If we get out of here and we see what's going on, we see that these are all, you see this note cannot override, and it's trying everything it possibly can with all the primitive types, and it still doesn't work. So the simple solution for us will be to define the friend operator. So we're gonna do that here. And so in dot H, that's where we use friend. We do standard O stream. Now with this call by reference, remember I can do multiple printouts in the same line. So what's going on is I take in the O stream, I take in the object, I print the objects out, and then I return the O stream. So that, that way, the next thing that can be used in that line can use it to print. So that's why we're returning with a call by reference. The next thing is the operator. And then we bring in standard O stream. And I'll just call it out. And then we want to be able to print const objects. And here we have an adder. And then we call by reference. And then we do, uh, I always just, mine is just print adder. And then we put in the semicolon like that. And so that makes us, that says, I declare that I can actually print this out. 
And so now that compiler isn't going to be trying to find every possible way I can do this. So then what I would do next is I would copy, copy everything but the friend keyword and then go down here to step five like that and then I would do return out, right? Does everybody see that so far? Okay, so there's, we found the issue. We haven't printed everything out, friend operator. And so what we're gonna do on each line is we're just gonna call print adder and then each private member because it's an operator, we can call dot street num dot street name dot street city and so on like this. So we can just say out and let me press enter a few times so those of you here can see. So we can do out print adder dot street num. And I would just do space like that. And then to make it simple, so you have the number, you have the street name. And then if you want, we can do a comma after that. Then we got city. State. And zip code. Uh, zip, uh, not street zip code, zip code. And if we save both of these, and let me minimize that back so you all can see it. But when we do this, it's now going to print correctly. So when I do clear, and then I run that same make adder test, it compiles, and if I want to do exe slash adder test. There were now two addresses that I have in there that I defined that I can print out. So the way I did this, we do adder test dot CPP. And in that file, I have two addresses. And to prove that I have done it correctly, I made one a const address just to prove that that object can work properly. So that way, all of the const and call by reference. If we're doing it this way, we can now tell the computer precisely what we want it to do. So this is one of the benefits of operators, is that if you have an object and you wanna do some sort of comparison, whether you're printing it or greater than or less than, you tell the computer what to do. If someone's trying to do that, they'll get a bunch of errors just like we had at the beginning of lecture. Does anybody have any questions before I continue? So now we're going to go over again class aggregation. So in student.h, so that's in the include folder and student.h, what we're gonna see here is we have guarded our header file and we've included adder.h. Now notice how I have string there. Because I've included adder.h, I don't need to type that pound define again. It will include it when we compile and run the program. So I can use that as, since I've correctly implemented it. So here I also have my default constructor. I have an overloaded constructor where I'm bringing in the first name, the last name, and an address. So you see I have it as const. So I can actually pass that const address into a, into a student and it will properly construct the object. And then I have several, several overloaded operators that I can do greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, less than, and equal equals. So I can compare if, these, if somebody is actually in the linked list that we're gonna build. And then I have also a friend stream. 
So our next step, what we're going to do is we are going to actually go into src student.cpp and we're going to write one of these operators together. So if you go into that file, into student.cpp, and we'll see if we go down here at line 12, it'll say step six, example of overloaded operators for student. So I have all the rest of them, but we're going to write one together to get the idea of how you would do this, especially as we want to take something like this and put it into a data structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a greater than operation, this operator. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to do, we want to return a bool. And this method is a student. And so we do operator greater than. I want to be able to compare const students. So if I declare a const student, I should be able to do that. And I always call it RHS for right hand side. And if, if I'm saying if A is greater than B, the calling object is A. So if A is const, I want that to be able to be const as well. So that is why we're now going to say that this method is const. Does that, yeah, I see there's a question being typed. Does anybody have a question in here? Yeah. Sure, okay, so we have, let's say, I'm just gonna make a comment here. Let's say I say if A is greater than B, right? If A is a const student, then I would want a const version of that object to be able to call the operator. If I don't have that as const, then what happens is it can't call it. By declaring a method as const, we are saying that any, I create an object and I never want it to change. For some reason, that is what makes my program work best. That means any object that should not change should still be able to do this operation. Hey, did that address your question? Awesome. Uh, I still see some typings going on. So let me remove the comments here. And now what I would do is I would put my brackets for procedure. So what I want to do with this operator is I want to say, if a name is greater, then return true. If it's not greater, return false. So operator here, what we're going to do, so I'm going to say this and simultaneously answer uh, the question in the Slack at the same time. In student test.cpp, I can actually compare students like this. So we see how const student two. Here, student two is on the left at line 39. It's the one that's calling it. So therefore a const version of a student should be able to run this operation. So uh, Francesca, I hope that addressed your question. And so about the brackets, I'll say it again. So the brackets are a procedure. In C++, this means start actually doing the work here, start ending the work there. And a member initialization list sets everything up it is a way of indicating precisely how you're putting it onto the data heap. So next, first I wanna say, if last name, so the student's last name is stu underscore last, if that's greater than RHS stu underscore last, then we can just return true. Then we have this scenario where if student last is less than RHS stu last, we can just return false. In fact, I'll just put else if, right? This last else case is what happens if the last names are equal. Brian Smith, Angela Smith. So now I want to say return stu first greater than rhs dot stu first. And so what we are able to do is by having this operator, we are saying we want to perform a greater than operation. 
And this greater than operation has one student on the left and another student on the right. And if the one on the left is greater than in the way in which we define it, so we are telling the computing device, when I say one student is greater than the other, this is what I mean. And you need to do that. So now we have every possible case. So what we're going to be able to do, we see that we had the operator here. So that dictates greater than. This takes, dictates greater than or equal. We have less than, less than, or equal to, or equals equals. Hey, did, so Francesca, did that address your question? And likewise, while well, I'm waiting for the, for the response there, does anybody have any other questions about this so far? OK. So we've got that. So that is our operator. And so there we've come up with the exact same thing. And so now what I want to do is I want to go to step seven in student.cpp. It's at the bottom, and it's the friend operator. And we're going to practice calling the private members of print stew when we have an aggregated class. So we're going to print out the first name, last name, and then on the next line, we're going to print out the address. So down here, if we scroll all the way down to, uh, I have it as line 89. It might be different depending on your spacing. We're going to print out these elements. So we can just say out. Let me make sure I have the right order. Last and then first. So here I have print stew. And because it's a friend, I have to call the name there. So I have to do print stew dot stew last. So now I would do comma print stew dot stew first. And I can do uppercase NL because I've included it from the header library. And this is why we want to return O stream. Because you see, I'm printing three elements. So I'm constantly passing the O stream along. And that's why we do standard O stream call by reference as the return. The next thing, again, let me print enter a few times so that those of you in the class can see it. Now, because I have an overloaded address, is it called stew adder? Sorry, uh, stew adder, yes. Right? So now we can print that, and we don't need to worry about anything else. So that does the work for us. Now we're aggregating the work. This is that message passing that I was talking about in the very first lecture. All right, so in main, I'm going to just going to open the file. We don't need to make any changes. I'm going to go through the whole thing. And first, I've created two addresses. Now I've created two students. One's regular and one is const. And then I have a third one has the same name. Because I want to do that because I want to test less than, greater than, equals, equals. So I print out student one and student two. And that's going to call the friend operator that we just wrote. And inside that, that's, that's, that's going to call the address operator. And it's going to do the same thing. Then I have a series of greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. In this case, and then I have student two equals student three. Since student two is equal to student three, even though one is const and one is not, this will still work. So when I run, uh, okay, good. I'm in the right place. Make student test. Oh, you know why? Because step eight is creating the make file. My apologies. So now what I want you to do is I want you to open the make file. And we're going to work on building an aggregated make file together. So if you open the make file here, Step eight will be on line 44 here. 
So what I want to do is I want to create all the objects first, and then we're going to build the executable. So here's the thing. We already have code here to create adder.o. We don't need that again. So what we're going to do is we are now going to do the student.o. And so we would do object student.o. And to do that, we need src student.cvp. Press enter in tab if you're doing it in Vim, especially for those of you who are on Macs and you've come to prefer that. You would just press enter and it would tab it automatically. And then we do the G++ flag. We do all those compiler flags. Dash C, because we are taking a, a C++ file and generating a .o file. So here it would just be student.cpp. Then, because I'm dictating what I want the object file to be called, I will then say dash O. And because I already have it defined here and I want to put it in that folder, that is why I do the dollar sign at. So I'm putting it at in the object folder and calling it student. Does that make sense? So now I want to do this with the student test. So a simple way to do it would just be to copy and then make sure you hit everything like so. And so now what we want to do is we're going to create a list of objects. And as we're going to see in this lecture, the list of objects gets bigger and bigger. So my recommendation would be to make it from the final executable and go from left to right in order of hierarchy. So I would call this student test objects. And it's colon equals when we're defining it. And then I would say student test.o, then student.o. And here's the crucial part. And some of you ran into this issue when you're working on Coding Challenge 2. You still need to include adder because adder is being compiled as well. And so the last thing I would do is I would put adder here. Does everybody see that so far? The last thing we will do is we will now build the actual executable. So the executable, we're going to call it student test. It's just a colon. And we, the, all the files we will need to build it will be dollar sign and then student test objects, like so. So that allows us to be able to say, we need all these objects, and therefore they all need to be created in order for this to run. And so then you would have the same thing, the C, G++ and all the flags. Dash O, because we're taking object files and putting them into an executable. And the format that is dictated here will be where we want to put the executable. So in this case, I would do dollar sign exe slash student test. And then after that, I do a space and all the object files that I need. Right. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right, so if I did everything properly, then what will happen is I will then run this make student test command again. We did it correctly. Now I'm going to run the one that we did in the executable, and we see that it prints out the two student names there and the conditions that pass. So stu1 is less than stu2, Kelly k is less than Morrison m, less than or equal to, and then student three was also a Matthew Morrison. They match perfectly. We now know that our operators work properly. Okay, I see there's a uh, question being typed. 
Let me run make clean for a moment. Oh, uh, so one thing that I saw in office hours, so when you put all the objects in the object folder, you don't need the star.o anymore because by running that particular portion of the make clean, it's getting rid of all the object folder files in that folder, and therefore you don't need another star.o after that. Okay, so there's the make file there, and we see that it now works and prints as we anticipate. So, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is we are now going to combine this class aggregation into templates, into data structures. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over the foundations based on what we learned on Tuesday of what is known as a doubly linked list. What we learned on Tuesday is a singly linked list, or at least the foundation of it. What we're gonna do is we're gonna build the same thing, except we're gonna encapsulate it in a class with the objective of making it easier for our programmer to use. So the idea behind a doubly linked list is I have a node and I can connect forward and backwards. So I have two pointers as a member of my node class. And this becomes very useful when you're trying to keep track of certain operations. It makes it easier to do recursion. It makes it easier to build something that we're gonna call a queue. And it makes it easier to be able to keep track of everything. The challenge is when we wanna delete something from the linked list, we have to be very careful with how we allocate pointers. So, and we're also gonna be doing comparisons because we need to say, if this pointer is pointing to the same place as that pointer, and in order to do that, we have to be able to be knowledgeable about void pointers. So hopefully you're gonna start seeing a lot of the things that we've learned up to this point combining into one big program. So here I have the beginning of a struct for a node. And if you look in your include folder, you'll see a complete node.h file. So we went through and wrote something very similar on Tuesday, but I'm gonna walk through it step by step, little piece by little piece, so that way you can see what's actually being done by this particular node and how we're gonna build it to a doubly linked list. So in this, I have a templated struct. By definition, structs, all of their members are public. So we don't have a private keyword unless you wanted to do that. In this case, I'm only gonna call the node struct inside the doubly linked list class. And the benefit of doing that is I am able to do the dot uh, data dot previous dot next without having to write any get or set method. So it's a little easier to program. It says I'm only using it in the doubly linked list. I'm not so concerned with data hiding. So that's where we start out here. I have my default constructor. And in the default constructor here, I'm calling whatever the uh, generic type for data, I'm calling its default constructor, and I'm setting the next and previous pointers to null. We currently are not pointing to anything. We are not linked. And for the overloaded constructor, I now bring in a piece of data. So if I've already constructed a student, I can do const t ampersand, and that will be beneficial. So here we're hopefully, and please stop me if you, if what I'm saying is unclear, shoot your hand in the air. I wanna make sure that this, is, this makes sense to everybody. So as you see with that student, it has strings, but it has other strings, it's aggregating an address. It's starting to get bigger and bigger as an object, right? If I weren't to call this by reference, I would be creating a completely new copy of the student. And if we're doing it working with Notre Dame's databases, I would be making a complete copy of your first name, your middle name, your last name, your address, your parents' name, your social security number, every single grade that you've got, including the data structures A you're gonna get at the end of the semester, right? Everything you're gonna have a copy of into the constructor, and that uses up a chunk of memory. By doing call by reference, we're able to code it in the exact same way, except 
Now we're reducing it to just pointer arithmetic. And then the same thing, we have data in and next and previous like so. In order for that to work, we now have the null keyword. Does anybody have any questions about that before I continue? What is T again? T is the generic type. So if I template this to student, it'll replace every instance of T here in the code with student. So Sebastian, does that address your question? So while that's coming up, let me, uh, awesome. So I have my destructor, I have private members that are pointers. So therefore we got to meet the rule of three. I want to point out first that here, notice how in delete, I have it commented out. We're going to change that. We're going to see a problem that that causes in a little bit. Well, what's going to happen is we want to use that recursive deletion and encapsulating a doubly linked list in the class is going to help us do better memory allocation. So we can recap why we use null for a question in the Slack, because as of right now, we have not linked this node to any other node. So we're using null to indicate it's not pointing to anything. So in the copy constructor, I just get the copy data and then we do the same thing here. In the assignment operator, we have, I call by reference for a node. And then if their addresses are equal, So we do have a destructor. So yeah, the, we are creating them. They might be a little behind on a video, but here they are right here, the assignment operator and copy constructor. And then I have another copy uh, assignment operator. And I wanna bring this, these two to your attention. I'm gonna zoom in. What's going on here? In fact, I'm gonna zoom in so that way it's just a little piece and not, we're not breaking it down too much. I wanna be able to make sure that I'm not just getting the same address, that if I have a node pointer, I wanna compare to see if I'm pointing at the same location. So I have two node pointers and I'm gonna see if they're equal. So I have this assignment operator, const node t star assign. Now here, this contains the base address that's being pointed to by the pointer. We're going all the way back to uh, lecture two. Remember when we had to cast to void star in order to be able to cat compare those addresses? Because address is only an address, it's not a data. So what we're doing here is I give me the address of a sign and I cast the void star so that way we can make that comparison. And here in this case, I'm gonna set it up and set x equal to uh, assign next and this previous equal to assign previous, even though you don't need the this, I still have it there. We're doing that because if I'm comparison, comparing them and doing an assignment operator, I want the node to be pointing to the same location. And then I do ret return star this, just like we've done with previous operators. And then here I have another operator and it's not equals where I bring it in, I just say, if this does not equal the address of RHS cast to avoid pointing. And so we're gonna be using these as we work through the doubly linked list class. And does anybody have any questions? Yes. The difference between the two assignment operators is this is a node that is called by reference that I can perform operations on. I have a different one for when I wanna do, when I wanna compare two node pointers. And I'm gonna show examples of this in the doubly linked list. And we're actually gonna code one in a moment. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so here is the copy constructor and assignment operator. And I'm also gonna mention why I don't have delete previous uh, in that destructor. So what we're gonna do is we are going, oh, wait. Uh, are these in your code? The copy constructor and assignment operator? 
Okay, so uh, one freebie on the house. How about that? All right, so you can work through that if you like, but that'll give you the opportunity to um, get some experience with that. The, the objective here is to do all this stuff. Okay, so there's the void pointers. Now in src node test.cpp, which is here, Wait, where's no test? Oh no. It was, I ran it at 11 o'clock today and it downloaded everything. Okay, so let me go over. All right, uh, spoil alert. I have Lex 7 here, which you downloaded, but in Lex 7 uh, folder, there's actually the solutions that you can review later. So, now in this file, let me go through and show you what's going on. In this file, I've created several addresses and several students. And so now what I've done is I've created nodes. Everybody see that? So when I create the node, what's going on here is that I'm taking in the student as part of the overloaded constructor and creating a node struct object where I have all that information. And I have node two and node three. And then what I have here is I'm linking them together. Node one dot next, which I'm able to do because this is a struct. And then appersand node two, node two previous is equal to node one. So the way it's working is that I have one, two, and three. Node one next is pointing to two. Node two previous is pointing to one. Node two next is pointing to three and node three previous is pointing to two. Now one was pointing to null and three is pointing to null. And in a doubly linked list, that's what we're gonna use to know whether or not we're at the beginning or the end of the list. Does that make sense? So if it didn't download that file, then I, what I'll do is I'll type it for everybody. So I'm gonna delete that because that is what the next thing I wanted to show you. So, and this will get, to, this will address your question in a lot more detail. So step nine, I'm gonna show you how it is that we're gonna use pointers to nodes to iterate through and print values. So first I can create a node pointer. So I'm gonna call it iter. I cast it to the exact same type because that allows me to know how to go through the memory. That's the benefit of templates and generics. I can let the data structure do the work for me, doing all this work for memory allocation. Does that make sense? So by casting it to the same type, but doing a star, I just say it's a pointer. Now it's only one register, but by casting it, we're doing the same thing that we did in the early in the semester when we did care star. By casting it, we are now telling the operating system Yes, it's a register, but we need to treat the memory I'm pointing at like a node that is templated to a student. So now we're giving it the data and the structure. So that's one aspect of it. So by this piece of code is actually saying, give me a register that I am going to interpret as a node star point. Wow, I wasn't even close, uh, node star. And it is pointing to the base address of node one. So let me type that part out for you. So I'm gonna type this here. I'm gonna say node student, that's the template. It's a pointer and I'm gonna call it iter because it's gonna be my iterator is at equal to the address of node one. So that's at the beginning of my list. 
say, are the brackets used to declare the data type for templated classes? Yes, that is exactly right. So here I am saying this is a templated type of student, which we have created, which is also aggregated off of address. So now we're building and putting everything together. So Carlo, please let me know if that addressed your question. The next thing I want to do is I can link up and say, I want to move to the next location. Yes. Correct. So the question is, do we have to use the copy constructor in order to build the pointer? The answer is no. And here's the reason why. A copy constructor creates, and in fact, any constructor. So we're talking about the constructor, building back to struct. Struct is the key word in constructor. When I am constructing a class object, I'm allocating memory onto the data heap for information, for data, right? When I create this pointer, like I did here in this line of code, all I'm doing is I'm not allocating memory and I'm not creating a new class object. What I am doing here instead is I am pointing to an object and I'm pointing to the address of the object. It is not a new object. So therefore we do not need the copy constructor or an overloaded constructor. Did that address your question? Awesome. All right, so the next thing here, if I want to point to the next location, so I have four nodes. I want to point to the next one. We have a member of that node that's pointing to the next node, right? So I can update that pointer to say, point to the next location like this. So let me press up so that way those, those of you in here can see everything. I can just say iter equals iter next. What that piece of code is saying is this. I have a pointer. I have dereferenced the pointer. Give me the value. Next is another node pointer. So now I'm just pointing from the previous one to the next one. Does that make sense? So now I'm iterating through. So now the last part is I can access the data by doing that same arrow notation. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, see out iter data like that. And what this allows me to do is it allows me to print out the data. I am dereferencing with that minus sign greater than. That's the same thing as doing star and point like you did in fun comp. It's dereferencing the pointer and giving me the data at that location in memory. And then the last part, I can iterate by saying, while it's not pointing to nothing. Null means it's not pointing anywhere. So we start out, we are pointing to a specific node. We keep going until we get to the location that it's null. So I can just do this. I can say while iter does not equal null. And this allows me to do that. So now I'm going to iterate through. And the reason I can do this not equals is because I defined it here in the bool operator. I say, oh, they're not equal. Now I know that I have some sort of comparison. So I'm saying if it's not pointing to nothing, so void star, if it's null, it'll be that 0x0 that you saw in the GDB experiment and it'll continue to iterate through. So now I'm gonna save this and run it. And forgive me, I'm gonna go up to uh, that particular folder. And we see that it compiles. Now in the compiler, I wanna point something out. Notice how in node test, I have adder, student, and node test. I don't have node because node is a templated class. 
I don't need adder test or student test because that's not part of this program. But I do need node test because I'm testing the node that is being templated to the student. So that's why I have those specific .o files. And what's gonna happen here is I'm going to, um, I hope uh, delete is not, is still commented. Uh, I can run exe slash um, node test. And it did seg fault, so it wasn't commented properly. So let me go to uh, include. I'm going to vim node dot h. And so here I have the delete uncommented. The reason I got that seg fault at the end as I was printing through everything is because it tried, it automatically calls the destructor and it deleted node one, then node two, then node three, then node four. But just like in last lecture, no one ever warned us that we weren't gonna be able to do that. So what happens is it tries freeing it again and it causes all kinds of problems. And see now that's the, we counter the same issue. But now we're going to leave it on, so we're going to, we would leave it uncommented in node.h. So if in your, in your node h file, uncomment the delete, that delete uh, next. And I'm going to show you what we're going to do instead here for the remainder of lecture to use classes to regulate memory allocation. And so that's where we're going to start learning about a doubly linked list today. So the doubly linked list, what we're going to do inside the class is we are going to have of this pointer pointing to the base address, just like before, except we're gonna have two pointers as a member of the doubly linked list. One is called head and one is called tail. And that tells us where the beginning and where the end is. Does the doubly linked list contain all different object types because of the template generalization? Yes. So what's gonna happen is you see everything that here that says data, What's going to happen in dlllist.h, I'm just going to show you the very top of the file, is that I have these two node pointers. I template to class T, so it is homogeneous. Every single node is going to contain the same type of data. And then I have these two head and tail pointers. And then when I do a constructor, What's gonna happen is, I don't have any data yet. I just say that right now, the head and the tail are null. And if they're both not pointing to anything, that means I have an empty doubly linked list. Does that make sense? So that's all we have for right now, just pointers. And so uh, Kristen, I hope that addressed your question. I have delete head and I'm gonna explain why uh, in this lecture or next uh, time dependent on why it is that we only do delete head and not delete tail. To give you a preview, it's because we don't want to have the double deletion. Yes. Uh, you, you, would you put the struct in? Yes. So a doubly linked list, both of these members are private because we don't want somebody who is trying to use the doubly linked list to control where the head and tail are. As I'm gonna show you today and in the next lecture, we need to keep track of where it all is and we are gonna write the delete method that will allow us to be able to control where all the nodes are. A linked list is specifically used in the event that we have limited memory and we want to put our data in specific locations. We're eventually going to learn about a, a dynamic array which has direct access but takes up a lot more memory. So we're kind of just getting started on doubly linked lists. We're going to take this lecture and then next Thursday's lecture to dig really deep into linked lists and how they're used. So right now the nodes are private and I have at the very top of included node.h. And so here, 
I have the default constructor. I have the destructor. And then you, at the copy constructor and assignment operator, you don't have anything, right? You shouldn't. I hope I didn't screw that part up. OK, let's work through the copy constructor and assignment operator of the doubly linked list together. So that way we can actually see a little more about how it works. So I'm going to go back to this folder I created here. And in dlllist.h, what you're going to see, there we go. Here it says stop nine. We're going to write the copy constructor and assignment operator of this doubly linked list together. And this will give you a little more familiarity with how we propagate through. So that way, when we start talking about insertion, deletion, being able to print everything out, you'll have a little more familiarity with how we actually go through point with pointer iteration. So with the copy constructor, what I would like you to do is, like before, it's DLL list. And with the copy constructor, we're bringing in a const DLL list templated call by reference. And I'm just going to call it copy. So now copy constructors have a member initialization list. So here I'm just going to say head. The head node is null. And the tail node, sorry, tail node pointer is also null. And now this is an example of when we'd want to do something in a constructor other than just initialize the member initialization list. So what's going to happen here is inside, I'm now going to go through and I'm going to copy all of the data. So we're going to do the same thing. It would be node T star, and I'm going to call it cur, which stands for current. And I'm going to set that equal to copy.head. So the doubly linked list that I'm copying is just pointing to the head node. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say while cur does not equal null. And we've been able to do that because of that assignment operator in node that we have. I can now say there's going to be a method that I'm going to show you probably next lecture called insert, where I'm just going to take the current and pass the data. So now I'm dereferencing the struct. I'm getting the data from the data heap, and I'm making a copy into the new doubly linked list. I'm not copying the pointers. I'm just copying the data and making a completely different doubly linked list. The last step here will be kind of like what I showed you before. We're going to say cur is equal to cur next. So now I'm saying I am pointing here, but it has its own pointer. So it's like, where am I pointing now? Now we move over here, and it's going to keep going until we hit null. Hey, does anybody have any questions right now? All right, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to write the assignment operator. So the assignment operators, if I say doubly linked list, list two is equal to list one. So it's different than the copy constructor. So this one here, what we're going to do is when we do, you do a copy constructor, you return. This one's going to be templated with a call by reference. And we do operator equals. And this one, we're going to do const dll list template call by reference, assign. So th the first thing I do every time I write an assignment operator is I want to make sure that they're not the same. If this does not equal the address of assign, do that. And at the end, you just do return star this, like always.
And then once you set this up, then everything is going to be the same as the copy constructor. So I'm going to quickly go up here and just get all of this, and I'd copy it inside here. And let me tab that over. All right, does everybody see that? So let me, um, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compile this now. And I'm going to show you kind of uh, make it DLL list underscore test. What folder am I in? Oh, I've got to go up one level. Sorry. Much more. That's like it. All right, so what I have here, and I'm going to go into the mechanisms of how this is done next lecture. But what's going on is we are going to, let me check this one out. Aaron. Uh, yes, I'm going to make sure everybody gets that for next lecture. Aaron's, Aaron's probably fed up with lecture too. Okay, so here, what I have done is I've created addresses, I've created students, and then I've created a doubly linked list. And then I have this insert method, which I'm gonna go over on uh, next Thursday. I'll make sure that I run some wget commands so we can continue working on this together. And then after that, which I'm gonna explain next week, I can print out the list. So we're going to go over the friend operator for that. And then I'm going to show you a contains method. And then we are going to, on Thursday to build a delete method together. So we're actually going to practice the idea of going through linking everything together. And then by the end of next Thursday's lecture, you have a strong understanding of singly and doubly linked list. And then what will happen is the copy that you'll get will have that commented out. But what's going on is that I've created all these objects and I've successfully linked them together in the data heap. And the reason why linked lists are useful is particularly in environments where memory is limited and you only have to allocate the memory that you need. Does that make sense? So what I would like you to do is since you have that, I would like you to follow the directions on the commit on the lecture 07 page. So please go ahead and do that. A good faith attempt is sufficient for full credit. And we have a minute and a half left in lecture. So while you all are doing that, I would be happy to take any additional questions about completing this. I see we have a, a comment in the Zoom chat. I will make sure that everybody gets dlllisttest.cpp. Let me check the Slack as well. Okay, so there's a couple of questions coming. So I'll address those. And then I'll make sure we wrap that up so that way we can have uh, a strong understanding. Is there any questions from anybody inside here in the Step-In Center? And thank you for being so nice to my dog, by the way. As we're waiting for the questions, does everybody feel a little more confident about how classes work, how everything links together? I see a lot of head nods, good. But I talked to several of you and based on your feedback, I want to make sure that this, I feel that this approach is a much better way of kind of uh, strengthening your understanding. So, so first question, what is the difference between using a struct and a class? So in this case, I, my design choice for the struct was that with node, and we're going to see this a lot more next week, with a node, what we're going to be able to do is say, all right, I can call the private members or I can call the members of the struct without having to write get or set method. So as a preview, I can access the data without having to write a method called get data. So that's one of the benefits. For a class, because we can make members and methods private, 
we can guard the data as we need so we can ensure that certain pieces of data can only be changed by either a constructor or by a method that we dictate to the user. Okay. So uh, let me Nick, let me know if that addressed your question. Uh, Zoom just crashed on me. Okay. Um, just uh, run the push commands for Git. So the student, the, the, the TA who's going to grade your coding challenge three will also grade this as well. So they're just going to put that into Sakai. Let me check the chat here. Okay, I don't see anything in the chat. So once you do that, um, you're, you may consider it submitted. If you had some issues, wanted to ask some questions, you're welcome to submit it through Friday night. So that way you can practice, get some experience. Right, on, so we, we have officially completed what I call unit one, where we get through classes, imperative programming, object-oriented programming, class aggregation, templates and generics. And starting next week, we will start digging into linked lists and eventually we'll get into dynamic arrays and hash tables, stacks and queues before the midterm. On that note, it is two o'clock and you are dismissed. <laughs>